Why don't we get started? Welcome everyone to the Rights of Nature 101 webinar offered by the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights. My name is Mari Margo and we are really pleased everyone is joining us. We had a really overwhelming response and I think it's because of my co-presenters, Thomas Lindsay, our senior legal counsel, and then two people who are doing really extraordinary work in Canada, um, who I'll be introducing um, in a little bit more, but um, Jenny Cardenas, a lawyer, um, and Pierre Olivier Boudreau, and forgive me if that pronunciation is slightly off. Okay, I got a thumbs up. Um, we're really, really pleased to have them join us to share their really important work around the Magpie River um, that you may have heard about, um, but we're just thrilled to have them with us. So just a little bit of background um, before we get started, um, just a little housekeeping. Um, we are going to uh, keep everyone on mute so that we can all hear the presenters clearly. Um, so if you become unmuted, please do mute yourself. We'll try to keep an eye on it as well. Um, but we really want this to be interactive. So please do submit any questions or comments you may have in the chat box within Zoom. Um, and then beyond that, um, we wanted to let folks know that this event is being recorded. Um, and we will make that recording available up on our website and YouTube channel and social media so that you can reference it or share it however you might like um, in the future. So with that, I wanted to let folks know um, that the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights we work with communities and grassroots groups across the United States, as well as at the state and federal level in the USA to advance democratic and environmental rights, including the rights of nature. Um, we're partnering as well with tribal nations, um, as well as working in other countries, including Australia and Tanzania and Nepal and Ecuador and Switzerland and other countries to advance rights of the natural world. And we invite you to partner with us, to learn more, to engage with us on this. The easiest way to do that is through our website. And we're putting that up um, in the chat box at centerforenvironmentalrights.org. Um, as well, you can always email us. The easiest way to do that is info at centerforenvironmentalrights.org. And we have a lot of new events coming up as well. So you can hear from our partners and people who are doing really great work around the world to advance legal rights, um, the human right to a healthy environment, legal rights of nature. Um, just to give you a quick sense of that, later this month, April 27th, we have a webinar, which we'll be hearing from Frank Bebo of the White Earth Nation, as well as Guy Ryder of the Menominee Tribe. Um, we're both working to advance legal rights of nature within tribal law and governance. So that will be a fantastic presentation. We've also just confirmed um, that on May 4th and May 5th in Australia, uh, we're going to be having a presentation on the Declaration of the Rights of the Moon with space archaeologist Alice Gorman, our colleague here at the Center for Democratic Environmental Rights, Michelle Maloney, um, and myself on this new declaration um, that's focusing off Earth, um, which is sort of a big, exciting development. And we also have a webinar coming up in later in May, on May 11th, with Dara Sorgetli of the Rights of Mother Earth Organization in Switzerland, and Pelle Thiel of Loden um, and the Rights of Nature Network in Sweden, who are gonna be focused on their work that they're doing to advance the rights of nature into the Convention on Biological Diversity, as well as the growing work in Switzerland to secure the rights of nature and the human right to a healthy environment within the Switzerland's federal constitution. So lots happening all over the world. We're very, very pleased to be able to join with people to partner on this, but also to bring you um, their presentations so you can hear from them and interact with them through webinars. So keep an eye out for those. You can learn more about those, of course, on our website and social media. We announce them through our e-newsletter. So we strongly encourage you to sign up for that. Um, that's just on our website, centerforenvironmentalrights.org slash newsletter. So, Getting to our focus today, the Rights of Nature 101 webinar. This is a sort of basic introduction to Rights of Nature. We hold these every quarter. The next one will be on September 9th. We also have more advanced training. So a Rights of Nature 201, as well as more advanced beyond that, 
particularly for people and communities and groups that are really looking to dive into rights of nature, bring a campaign to the place where they live and advance it into law or policy or government. So it's a great launching point to learn about that, develop strategies, and move a campaign forward. So we really encourage you to learn more about those on our website, ask us questions. We're very happy um, to engage with folks on those and see what we wanna set up, which would best work for your organization or community. So with that, let's jump in um, to Rights of Nature 101. Our first speaker today will be my colleague, Thomas Lindsay. He's our senior legal, legal counsel, our lawyer here at the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights and he's been moving rights of nature laws and governance forward from the very, very beginning, uh, working on the very first rights of nature law anywhere in the world, in Pennsylvania and the United States back in 2006. So he's been with this movement from the very beginning and helping it to grow. We also will have, as I mentioned earlier, two incredible people from Canada who have worked on the Magpie River rights law, which you may have heard about. They're gonna share with us some of that work We'll be having um, Jenny Cardenas. She's a lawyer and president of the International Observatory on the Rights of Nature. She also teaches international public law, water law, rights of nature law, and comparative law at the University of Montreal. We will also be joined by Pierre Olivier Boudreau. He's a professional biologist and he works as director of conservation for the Quebec section of the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society. So they bring a wealth of experience to this work and we're gonna be hearing from them later in the hour. We're gonna start off though with Thomas Lindsay. He's going to give us a shortened version of our Rights of Nature 101 webinar, um, followed by Jenny and Pierre Olivier, um, who will speak about that work in Canada. So I'll stop there, introduce Thomas, have him join us. Um, and again, folks, just if you could keep muted, that would be great so we can hear everybody clearly. And don't hesitate to put in a comment or question into the chat box because we'll have time at the end for questions and answers and discussion. So with that, Thomas, please take it away. Great, thank you, Mari. And, and also to, uh, to let folks know, as Mari did to reiterate that we're recording this, so there'll be a recorded version available on our webpage. And also we're Facebook living it. So we have some viewers on Facebook Live and that version will also be available for people to, to watch as well. So uh, let's get down to business, uh, trying to leave as much space as possible for our special guests today. But this is uh, the Rights of Nature 101 sessions that we teach are could be subtitled, everything you've always wanted to know about rights of nature, but we're afraid to ask. Uh, and so what are we talking about when we talk about rights of nature? Well, we're talking about recognizing human civil rights type protections for nature. So again, kind of the, you know, the shorthand is recognizing human civil rights type protections for nature. And as a lot of people usually ask, why do we need human rights type protections for nature? That's the natural next question. And the answer is that we wouldn't be talking about rights of nature if our existing environmental protection system was actually working. And I don't think we need to really remind folks that it's not working, but in the US alone, just some, some scattered statistics, we put 4 billion pounds of toxic uh, chemicals into the atmosphere each year. We have 80,000 industrial chemicals currently in use in the United States, and we find 700 of those chemicals in every human body in the US. Half of all plant and animal species have been driven to extinction. 90% of all original forests have been logged. 40% of all waterways fail to meet minimum clean water standards in the US. And perhaps the, the biggest uh, you know, elephant in the room, so to speak, is that even the most uh, pessimistic predictions about climate change are now proving to be downright optimistic. Uh, so suffice it to say that 40 years after the major environmental laws were passed in the United States, Things are worse now by almost every major environmental statistic. And that's led a lot of us, especially those who have practiced environmental law for the past 20, 30, or 40 years, to really begin to question the whole framework of how environmental law is practiced in the US and elsewhere. And so just the, the basics of environmental law and the basis of law in general is that we in the US live under this Western system or European system of law. And that Western system of law basically treats nature as a dead thing, as an inanimate object. 
So the Western system of law, this Western system structure of law that we have basically treats nature as an inanimate object, as a dead thing, uh, not a living thing, but as a dead thing to be, whose use is to be regulated. And we contrast that with the vision of indigenous peoples towards nature, uh, that nature is not a dead thing, but a, but a living entity. And so you hear the Ponca Nation in Oklahoma, for example, talking about the need to speak for those without voices. And the White Earth Chippewa, the Anishinaabe people in Minnesota, talking about the flying people and the swimming people and the singing people. And the Yurok Nation in California talking about the Klamath River being a relative or a living being. So uh, a living entity, a relative, which is much different than how we speak about nature under a European or Western system of law. And the quote that we sometimes use uh, to describe that Western system of law in a nutshell comes from Sir Francis Bacon, a famous English philosopher. And it's not often on our webinars that we get to talk about Sir Francis Bacon, but uh, so what did Sir Francis Bacon say about nature? Well, he said that the job of Western civilization was to quote, torture nature on a rack to extract her secrets. So I don't know about you, but I can't find a, a more of a different kind of worldview between the flying people, swimming people and singing people versus torturing nature on a rack to extract her secrets. But that's kind of the spectrum that we're talking about here between uh, the way that indigenous people see nature and ecosystems versus how this Western European system sees nature. So of course, indigenous communities for thousands of years have treated nature as something other than property. But our Western system of law, our Western philosophy of law, hasn't really caught up to that indigenous concept of nature. And in 1972, something important happened, which was this concept of rights of nature or status of nature kind of emerged uh, when a professor of law at USC, University of Southern California, came out with an article. He wrote a law review article called Should Trees Have Standing? And this is uh, Professor Christopher Stone, who was a law, uh, law professor at USC at the time. And he wrote this article which suggested that nature should have standing of its own to be in court. And so standing is, is this legal principle that you can't really file a lawsuit unless you've been personally kind of physically injured by something. In other words, you can't, you can't bring a lawsuit based on an amorphous claim that somehow you're affected by something that's happened somewhere. You actually have to prove to a court that you've been injured by someone else's action and therefore you're bringing a lawsuit to kind of remedy that harm that's been caused by that action. What Christopher Stone back in 1972 said, kind of for the first time, at least in this Western system of law, was that nature should have the ability to sue on its own. That ecosystems should be able to be plaintiffs, that forests should be able to be plaintiffs, that rivers should be able to be plaintiffs. Basically the first kind of semblance of this concept of nature is something other than property, that nature should be a living entity treated on its own and that nature should have entryway into the courts on its own as well. And I think that law review article would have gotten lost as most law review articles do. I've written several and they sit on the law school shelves, probably gathering dust at this point as with most other law review articles. But there was a court case running uh, parallel to this law review article that Christopher Stone wrote. And it's not important about the details of the case, but. Uh, the Sierra Club of California brought a lawsuit to try to stop Walt Disney Corporation from developing a ski resort uh, in California. And the lower courts dismissed the case, finding that the Sierra Club didn't have standing to be in court, that the Sierra Club hadn't shown that they would be physically injured by this development that the Walt Disney Corporation was putting in the ski resort. And they threw the Sierra Club out of court. And the Sierra Club appealed to the US Supreme Court and eventually the US Supreme Court heard the case. The case is known as Sierra Club versus Morton. And that case also probably would have been heard and gone on its way without too much attention, except for a dissenting opinion, which was written by Justice William O. Douglas of the US Supreme Court, probably one of the most progressive Supreme Court justices that we've had on the Supreme Court. Uh, and he wrote a dissenting opinion, which said, that instead of the Sierra Club suing in this case, that nature should be allowed to sue. 
that instead of looking at the standing of the Sierra Club and whether the Sierra Club was injured enough to bring the case, which the US Supreme Court eventually decided that they hadn't shown and dismissed them, that nature should have been allowed to bring the case itself in the name of nature. In this case, uh, in the name of Mineral King Valley, which is where the Walt Disney Corporation had proposed to put in a ski resort. So the valley itself as a plaintiff and therefore the inquiry would be, would be whether the valley itself had standing, which is kind of automatic because the valley was being destroyed to put the ski resort in, rather than whether the Sierra Club or people had standing as members of that group. And so again, Christopher Stone, law, law professor, 1972, should trees have standing? Uh, the law review article was cited by the US Supreme Court and in this dissenting opinion, which has become famous at this point, uh, that Justice William O. Douglas essentially said that nature should be able to be a plaintiff, that nature should have rights and be able to represent itself in court and therefore eliminate the standing inquiry that sometimes shoots people out or groups out from being able to defend nature. So the next question that's usually asked is, well, what happened? What happened after 1972 with this Law Review article and the Supreme Court case? And the answer is almost nothing happened, which is not unusual uh, when a decision comes out. Nothing happened, which is that it, the decision just sat there and the Law Review article kind of sat there. And it, it all sat there until 2006 when a small community that I was working with in, uh, in Pennsylvania, Northwest of Philadelphia, uh, began to uh, try to battle a project that was initiated by the state of Pennsylvania and the state of Maryland to dump uh, dredge from the Delaware River into open mine pits within this community. And the community's name is Tamaqua, Tamaqua Borough. Uh, just northwest of Philadelphia, about 7,000 people in the community. Uh, suffice it to say that this dredge coming in from the Delaware River was full of PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, very toxic uh, chemical constituent uh, that the state wanted to have dumped into this particular community. The people of Tamaqua who didn't want to be a toilet uh, for PCB-laden dredge coming in uh, talked to uh, me about drafting a local law in the borough of Tamaqua that would stop the dredge from coming in, to ban the dredge uh, from being dumped into this community. And we began to have conversations with them based off of Justice William O. Douglas's dissent and should trees have standing and this indigenous understanding of nature as being something else other than property. And we talked with them about uh, passing, uh, adding a provision to the ordinance that they were talking about to ban the dredge that would recognize that the Wabash and Panther Creeks and Little Schuylkill River within the community of Tamaqua, uh, recognizing them as having rights of their own. So rights of the creeks and rights of the river, the Little Schuylkill River provides Philadelphia with drinking water. Uh, and the ordinance that, uh, that I developed for them and drafted for them dealt with the rights of those waterways to exist, flourish, and naturally evolve. So basically standalone rights that accrued to those waterways. And then the law allowed any resident of the community to bring suit, file a legal action in the name of those waterways. Uh, if those waterways uh, rights were threatened by activities like the dredge dumping that was slated to occur within Tamaqua. In addition to the allowing residents to sue on their behalf of the waterways, uh, the remedy that was established in the ordinance was to require the polluter to restore the waterway back to its pre-damaged state. So a remedy uh, rolled up within this particular law. What's interesting about what was passed in Tamaqua Borough back in 2006 is that it's remained pretty much, the language is unchanged. Some of the concepts have been unchanged since 2006 uh, when they were first passed in Tamaqua. And in passing that law in Tamaqua Borough, Tamaqua became the first community in the world to adopt a rights of nature law that recognized nature as having certain legally enforceable rights. And as we all know, we live in a very small world at this point. So what happened in Tamaqua, the word kind of circulated. And uh, one place where the word circulated was Ecuador, which was working on a new national constitution. And so the next thing that we know is we get a call from the Ecuadorian folks working with the Ecuadorian Constitutional Assembly for us to come down to Ecuador to assist with the drafting of the new national Ecuadorian constitution because some Ecuadorian Constitution Assembly delegates 
uh, wanted to write rights of nature into that new Ecuadorian constitution. And so uh, we traveled down, Mari and I actually traveled down to Ecuador to meet with the Constitutional Assembly and the committees that were uh, created underneath that assembly and assisted with the drafting of language to be inserted into a new Ecuadorian constitution to recognize ecosystems as having rights within the country of Ecuador. And as most folks may know, uh, the Ecuadorian constitution, that new constitution was overwhelmingly ratified by the people of Ecuador making Ecuador the first country to incorporate rights of nature provisions into their national constitution. What happened after that's been kind of a speedy rise for those constitutional provisions. First enforcement case was brought in 2011 by a river, the Vilcabamba River in Ecuador. First ruling ever in which a judge ruled in favor of a river as a plaintiff. Uh, the case name is known as the Vilcabamba River versus the province of Loja. There have been a little over three dozen cases in Ecuador enforcing the rights of nature provisions. And just recently, uh, the Constitutional Court in Ecuador, which is the highest court that interprets the Constitution, has accepted a bunch of cases for review uh, and will be issuing a ruling here shortly on some of those cases dealing with the kind of limits of rights of nature jurisprudence uh, and maybe expanding that rights of nature jurisprudence to include uh, mining bans and conservation areas and dealing with a variety of other issues uh, that affect or uh, raise rights of nature issues from that Ecuadorian constitution. So Ecuador puts it into the new national constitution. It makes news, boomerangs back to the US. Uh, the city of Pittsburgh, which was working to ban fracking within city limits, uh, called us to write a draft ordinance that would both ban fracking, but also uh, recognize rights of, of rivers for the three rivers, the Ohio, the Allegheny, and the Monongahela that run through the city of Pittsburgh. By unanimous vote, the city council of uh, Pittsburgh in 2010 enacted that law, becoming the largest municipality, most well-known municipality in the United States to pass a rights of nature law. And then something happened that surprised us after the passage in Pittsburgh, which was there were a bunch of international judicial developments around rights of nature. Up to this point, most of the lawmaking that had been done was legislative. So people sitting down, writing laws, going through the process, passing them either at the municipal level or at the international level in the case of Ecuador. But what started to happen is courts in different countries began taking rights of nature principles, mostly from Ecuador, and holding that they were basically the new international norm a judicial norm for environmental protection and incorporating those principles into their decisions. So in 2016, the Colombian Constitutional Court recognized the Atrato River in Colombia as having rights. In 2017, in India, uh, an Indian court recognized the Ganges and Yamuna River as having certain attributes of legal persons and rights. In 2018, the Colombian Supreme Court ruled that the Amazon, the Amazon River Basin had certain legally enforceable rights. And in 2019, the High Court of Bangladesh uh, ruled that all rivers within the country had certain legal rights. And then those international judicial developments kind of came all the way back around to indigenous communities in the United States. So in two, 2015, we had the first tribe uh, in the United States, the Ho-Chunk tribe in Wisconsin, which took a vote on a rights of nature resolution for the tribe. And in Ponca, uh, the Ponca tribe in Oklahoma have adopted a rights of nature customary law. The Ojibwe, Chippewa, Anishinaabe people and White Earth Nation in Minnesota have adopted a law that we drafted uh, protecting wild rice or monomen. It's the first law recognizing a species, in this case, a plant species as having certain rights. The Menominee tribe in Wisconsin uh, passed a resolution dealing with the Menominee River having rights. The Yurok tribe uh, has adopted uh, tribal laws uh, dealing with the Klamath River, recognizing the Klamath River as having rights. The Nez Perce tribe, uh, the most recent uh, tribe to take action, has recognized that the Snake River has certain legal rights. So indigenous communities taking the lead uh, in some ways in terms of uh, drafting and adopting these tribal laws and constitutional provisions dealing with the rights of nature. And just to finish up today before I pass it over to our guests, uh, uh, talking about how kind of this rights of nature concept has moved from the lunatic fringe, you know, kind of the fringe ideas more and more to the mainstream. 
And so in the US, we've had uh, three law schools, Tulane Law School, Vermont Law School, the Levin College of Law in Gainesville uh, have uh, host symposia and fora on rights of nature. So rights of nature conferences. We co-hosted uh, the ones at Tulane and in Gainesville, Florida, but with speakers speaking about rights of nature, basically kind of mainstreaming the concept. And it surprises people to learn also that the rights of nature made it into the Democratic National Committee platform uh, back in uh, 2016 uh, as a provision supporting indigenous communities and rights of nature, passage of rights of nature law by indigenous communities. Uh, made it into the Democratic National uh, Party uh, platform in 2016. And in addition to that, uh, the Florida Democratic Party has recognized support for rights of nature within their uh, platform uh, for the state of Florida also. And I think as evidence of that kind of moving into the mainstream, I personally have no doubt that this is the, the default for environmental law in the next 20, 25 years is going to be rights of nature. Uh, but in Florida in 2020, the most populous county in the United States adopted a rights of nature law uh, that was drafted by uh, communities in Florida who were fed up with the water pollution and water quality situation in Florida. And folks are familiar, I think, more than ever with that now, especially with the phosphate mining pond leaks uh, in Piney Point, Florida, which have been in the national news for the last couple of weeks, this evacuation of radioactive and other water from the phosphate mining ponds. And so anybody that's familiar with Florida, you know, the red tide, the algae blooms, dead sea life being scooped up off beaches with backhoes, Biscayne Bay, which several months ago went to zero dissolved oxygen levels, creating this huge fish kill uh, within Biscayne Bay, that folks in Orange County, Florida came together to propose an initiative which would recognize both people's right to clean water but also the rights of uh, waterways within Orange County, specifically the Wakaiba River and the Econ Hatchie River. And the law was eventually expanded out beyond those two rivers to the waters of Orange County. But I think to a lot of people's amazement, the initiative which appeared on the ballot for a popular vote in November of 2020 uh, obtained 89% of the vote in Orange County, which goes to show that the folks in Florida, folks in Florida can't agree to anything else probably except for clean water and rights to clean water and in this case rights of nature. So 30th largest county in the United States, Orange County, 1.4 million people in the county recognizing waterways rights to exist, flow, be free from pollution and maintain healthy ecosystems. Uh, and now folks are working on enforcement uh, issues around that law that was passed in November of 2020. So all to say, uh, kind of rights of nature is on the move. Uh, it's constantly expanding, constantly accelerating. Uh, different communities are recognizing the need for it, including indigenous communities in the US and elsewhere. And I think that fits in very nicely with our, our guests today, uh, who are gonna speak with us about the first laws that have been passed in Canada uh, on rights of nature. And so just to, to reintroduce our two guests, uh, we have Jenny Cardenas, who's a lawyer and president of the International Observatory on the Rights of Nature. Uh, and again, she teaches international public law, water law, rights of nature law, and comparative law at the University of Montreal. And Pierre Olivier Boudreau, a professional biologist, and uh, he works as director of conservation for the Quebec section of the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society. And uh, the, those two are gonna talk with us today about the first Canadian laws to recognize the rights of nature. And so I'd like to turn it over to the two of them. They're gonna speak for a little bit and then we're gonna come back to Q and A and facilitate some uh, questions for our guests as well as, as for us. So Jenny and Pierre Olivier, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Thomas. And uh, hello everyone, bonjour tout le monde. Um, I'm really happy to be here with you today uh, to speak about the, the Magpie River and this first case in Canada where a uh, river has been recognized as a, as a legal person. Um, so again, thank you for the invitation to the Center for uh, Democratic and Environmental Rights. I'm gonna try to share uh, my screen. because I have a few pictures of the river that I'd like you to see. Um, let me know if that works well. So 
Okay. Is everything fine? Good. So a uh, few words maybe about uh, about uh, the, the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society. For those of you who don't know the organization, we're um, a non-governmental organization based in Canada. Uh, we're an environmental organization. Our mis mission is to protect the wide spaces of Canada uh, through a network of protected areas, but uh, other tools as well. Uh, we have been existing since 19, 1963, so we've been there for quite a while. We're all across the country in every province and territory. And um, in, my, uh, in my end, I've been working for the Quebec section since uh, 2013. And um, I'm going to give you a, a quick overview of the, the campaign to, uh, to protect the Magpai River, where we're coming from. Uh, and Yeni is going to be talking more about uh, the, um, you know, the legal tools that we use, the mechanisms that we chose to use for this river. But um, you know, the Magpai River is it's just not any river. It's, um, it's a river in Quebec, Canada, that is, um, well, now it's becoming more famous, but it's, it's, it's a world-class river for whitewater activities. It's been... Um, you have a picture of the river here. It's a river that is in the heart of the boreal forest, uh, surrounded by uh, conifer, uh, coniferous stands. Um, the watershed of the river is 99, more than 99% intact. It's a river that's about uh, 180 miles long, so 300 kilometers, um, and that spans from uh, from the the Labrador to, uh, to to the Saint Lawrence River of Quebec. For those who are familiar with our uh, geography. And I was I was mentioning that a river is a world class river for whitewater activities. Um, it's uh, it's been ranked by many magazines, including the famous National Geographic as a the, the, the National Geographic ranked it second in the world for rafting activities. Uh, it's a river that's really uh, uh, it's been compared by um, in a study that we commissioned to rivers such as the Colorado River, uh, the Middle Fork in the Idaho. Uh, the Futalefu River in Chile. So all these very famous and prestigious whitewater rivers. And so if you compare the rapids of the river, it's, it stands uh, really well uh, with, with those other rivers that are famous and uh, well visited. So um, the, the short story is that in 2009, um, paddlers of Northern Quebec contacted our organization because I mean, they've been on the river for, uh, for a lot of time. And uh, the river was uh, was becoming threatened by hydroelectric development because it's a it's a whitewater river, so it, uh, you can see it on the um, tourism and recreative uh, perspective, but you can also see it from the hydro development perspective. So these paddlers were very worried. The um, Hydro Quebec, which is the um, energy on state uh, the state energy company in Quebec. Uh, had put the MAGPAI in its strategic plan for uh, an industrial development. We're talking about uh, around 850 megawatts. Uh, this is a huge project. So uh, at that point, we started a campaign with different partners. Uh, so this local paddlers association, uh, you have to know that the MAGPAI River is in the, what we call the Nitasinan, which is the ancestral land of the Innu First Nation in Quebec. And it's also in a region called Mangani, uh, which has uh, a, about 10 municipalities, but it's a region that is as huge as the island of Ireland. So it's a huge region. So, so this is the global context. We started a campaign back at that time, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but we start, we did actions like traditional start. We started with a petition. Uh, we uh, ordered the study, commissioned the study that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we do, did a lot of um, political representation because the river is, um, even if it's a, a world-class river for whitewater activities, it's not well known in, even in Quebec. Um, I would say that now it's getting more and more famous because of our, uh, our actions and the recognition of legal personhood status. But we took a lot of time to, to get the river known and um, outline its importance in Quebec. Uh, we even organized a protest at the time. And at some point, our, our goal was to have a, a protected area recognized by the Quebec government, legal recognition is permanent, as you know. But at, uh, at some point, we found out that the, yeah, the combat was getting uh, really fierce. 
especially with Idle Quebec, was refusing uh, to have a protected area created. So around, I would say around 2018, uh, we started thinking about an alternative way to get the river protected, uh, knowing that we would basically have to um, get the, the approval from Hydro Quebec to have this river protected and that this was not coming. So we started, I mean, at that time in 2018, uh, the Wanganui River in New Zealand was, uh, the case was, was uh, all in every media. Uh, we had heard about the Tamaqua um, resolutions that were mentioned by Thomas, the Ecuadorian constitution. So we, uh, at that time, we contacted uh, the uh, International Observatory on Nature's Rights, um, which is, as you know, based in Montreal. Uh, and uh, we started thinking, not especially about the Magpie River, but uh, we, 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 we looked at different cases in Quebec where this mechanism of protection could be applied. And we really found out that the Magpie River was the perfect case because, of course, of the international recognition but because of the link between the river and the Inu First Nation, and also the, 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 um, the consensus to protect the river, the regional consensus, especially from the municipalities uh, and the powers that the municipalities have also over uh, land management and water management in Quebec. So uh, we, we decided at that point to, uh, to really put our efforts on that case to make it the first case in Quebec. And uh, we also work with, uh, with different uh, lawyers, uh, even right, law students. Uh, we made research on what was happening in the world. So, uh, and it ended up, uh, long story short, it ended up in the announcement uh, on February 23rd um, of the recognition of the, 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 the river as a legal person by two resolutions uh, that Yeni is going to present more in details. So we, all, we spent a lot of time, of course, uh, on this, this announcement and making sure that uh, the case was heard because it's very important as well. Uh, all the, the, the right uh, and the, the legal work behind is really important, but also to get the, um, the communication aspect is really important to get, uh, get attention on the river and on the case. So at that point, uh, I would, uh, Jenny, I would uh, lend you the mic to uh, talk in details about how uh, the legal, legal me mechanisms that we chose and uh, all the work that you did uh, to help us. Thank you so much, uh, Pierre Olivier, for this beautiful presentation. Um, yes, I'm going to talk to you uh, about the legal part. I'm the president of International Observatory on the Rights of Nature. And as you know, I have taught uh, water law. So I've been studying uh, water management for many years and I've seen many different models and I saw uh, also the weakness of different models as now we have the tragedy of the commons and we have also water markets uh, where we have totally forgotten um, bio biodiversity. So um, I started studying the Sumakasai approach in 2016. Uh, I went also to uh, Ecuador to see another way to, to live uh, in harmony with nature. So I was wondering uh, what did it mean and what was the difference between uh, the Summa Causae approach and the um, sustainable development approach. And then uh, in that, at that time, I wrote an article and I discovered also the rights of nature. And I started to interest myself and what would uh, imply for everybody to recognize the rights of nature. And then when I saw uh, many recognition as the uh, Fanganui River in New Zealand and the Atrato River in Colombia, um, the Ganges and Yamuna in India, so we were very inspired. We, we wanted to know more at the first time we, we heard uh, that that we uh, they had uh, legal personhood we are very like everybody's um, at this moment like chugged we want to know more we want to explore and then we discover and we discover what it implies and uh, we did many interviews in colombia too with the justice who took the decision in colombia and uh, with people who work with communities and was so inspiring that we wanted to, uh, um, we founded the International Observatory on the Rights of Nature to follow the movement, to discover more, and now to share. We are sharing and we are participating. Uh, we had the chance to participate in this first case in, in, 
in Canada, thanks to the invitation of the Pierre Olivier, who called us because we wanted to start with a big step with the St. Lawrence River, but the St. Lawrence River is huge. And um, so Pierre Olivier uh, allowed us to, uh, um, to find the first case, a beautiful case, because we have a beautiful cons uh, consensus between indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. And as uh, you know, we have many ways to um, introduce the rights of nature in a juridical system. Um, as uh, Thomas uh, talked before, we have the constitution or via legislation, uh, jurisprudence, municipal ordinance, uh, indigenous people council resolutions. But for that case, for the MAPAI case, the best way um, we consider to adopt twin resolutions one from the municipal um, uh, county, regional uh, county municipality of Mangani, another one from the uh, um, council, indigenous council of Equanichi. So uh, if you, we can see the next um, uh, diapositive, Pierre Olivier. Thank you so much. So um, uh, Magpie River has its personhood thanks to both resolution, twins resolution. Why we use the term twins resolution? Because they are very similar. At the first glance, you can think they are almost the same, but they are not. Each one are unique in, uh, in, um, in, in, in a way that I'm going to explain you later in the next uh, uh, slide, please. You're going to see, we have in, to in the twin resolution, we have four parts and we have an operative part. So the first part, the identification of the Muteheko Shipu is the name of the river in Inu language or the Magpai River. It's a geographical part that Pierre Olivier explained very well. So they are the same in, twin, in both resolutions. That part is geographical, we cannot change it at all. The, part, the second part uh, are different in both resolutions. Why? Because it's the link between the Muteheko Shipu or Magpai River with the Inu people of Efkwanichit, and also it's different with the link of the community of the regional county municipality with the river. So for example, for the Inu of Efkwanichit, they, they have a link that comes from thousand years. They are there, they are um, in that territory for many years ago. So the relationship is different. They uh, consider water as sacred, uh, as alive, that the, the river has a soul, that is part of their identity, their culture, etc. But the community of the uh, regional county municipality, they have also an important link, attachment to the river, but it's different. So in both resolutions, you can find which are the link that uh, attach the communities to the river. So uh, it makes those resolutions unique. The third part, I think it's important to, to show to people who are going to read uh, those resolutions, is the worldwide movement to recognize rivers as entity subject of rights. So to show that this is not an isolated uh, decision, but it is part of a movement. And thanks to that, Canada is joining the movement. So we show in that part that, um, that uh, what Thomas explained very well before, that uh, uh, many countries as Mexico, uh, Ecuador, Bolivia, New Zealand, Australia, etc., have recognized um, rivers as entities, uh, subjects of rights. So we place the movement like it's, it's not alone, it's not isolated, we're part of a whole. And so that part is going to be the same in the twin resolution, both resolutions. And the part number four, they are going to be different also. Why? Because we have the legal foundations. So the municipalities in Canada, they have many rights. They have the power to adopt resolution, to pass resolutions to protect the environment and water. So they are based on legal foundation, Canadian legal foundation. But as you know, or maybe you don't know, some of the, we have in Canada three legal systems that coexist. So we have common law, we have civil law in the province of Quebec, but we have also 
uh, indigenous legal traditions. Sometimes we forgot they exist, but they exist. So um, indigenous people, they have the right to pass legal uh, resolutions that reflect their own traditions and culture. So that resolution is founded in that um, legal foundation, but also in the UN Declaration of um, Indigenous People's Rights that recognize the principle of self-determination. And as you know, Canada uh, has signed that declaration. So we have the obligation to integrate and to open uh, indigenous legal tradition into the legal system of Canada. So that part are very different in both resolutions, but are supporting finally the operative part. And that part, finally, we are going to see that both the um, regional county municipality and the council of Quanichit, they uh, recognize the river as a legal person with rights, with the same rights. So that part going to be almost the same as with a slight difference. And those are the rights that, that have been recognized to the river. The right to live, to exist, and to flow. So as you see, they are very simple uh, rights, very important for a river. They are not the same as human rights, as you may know. The right res the, to respect for its natural cycles, the right to evolve naturally, uh, the right to maintain its natural biodiversity, uh, the right to be free from pollution, the right to take legal action, etc. So you have nine, uh, nine in total, nine rights that have been recognized. And also an important part that I want to highlight that you can find also um, uh, the responsibilities and duties that have been uh, followed by guardians. Because we have interviewed so many guardians around the world and they say, yes, we are guardians of that river, but we don't know what we have to do. So we said that it's important for guardians to know what they have to do, what are the main responsibilities. And also, but you know, as you know, the main responsibility is to protect river rights. So I think this is a, um, a new approach. And we have been supported uh, for, by international forums. Uh, we were inspired by the Universal Declaration of River Rights uh, that have been written by Earth Law Center. Also, um, we thank the Harmony with Nature chapter in United Nations who give an outreach of all the, the uh, resolutions and juridical system that have adopted this new paradigm. So uh, we really thank those partners. And today we, we are very recognized of the work of the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights for inviting us to share with you uh, this experience because as you know, this is new law and this is um, the fruit of a social construction. And we are there to construct it and to create a new model to protect uh, nature and to change finally, as everybody wants to change the world. So thank you so much for um, having me today and we are open for any question you have. Thank you. Great, thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Pierre, Olivier. So we have a bunch of questions that have come in by text, Facebook Live, there's some questions here as well. So I'm gonna, we only have a little bit of time, but I, I'm gonna curate some of the top ones off the stack. So one of the questions that's come in, the background is in the US, it's difficult to have these conversations with elected officials, uh, especially at the municipal level about the need to pass rights of nature laws, especially in places where they haven't been passed before. So can you guys give a kind of flavor of those conversations and maybe pushback that you got from elected officials? How difficult was it to get this thing passed through especially the municipal council? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. And uh, it's not every municipality in Quebec that is uh, as uh, exemplary and uh, as showing as much leadership as the manganese municipalities uh, and i have to acknowledge that it was it was not always easy i made a really short story but uh, when i mentioned that we made political representation uh, what you have to know is that this region of quebec has already given a lot in terms of river a lot of big rivers were dammed 
you might already know, I mean, in, just if you look at the world, like we have uh, over uh, 800,000 dams in the world, uh, more, I think as 80, um, uh, 50,000 of them are like really huge dams. This is, these are the types of dams that we have in, in this region of Quebec. So at some point I felt like uh, the, the tipping point was that elected officials wanted a somewhat a balance between hydro development and other types of development or uh, for rivers, such as what we were proposing with the Magpie River. And I mentioned at the start that the Magpie River is, is not any river. It's a river that is famous across the world and recognized as a whitewater river. So that was really helpful to convince the local uh, representative um, to that another type of development was possible for this river. Jenny, do you want to add to that? Uh, Pierre Olivier was a leader in that uh, in that part. So just to, to maybe add a second part to that question, in the U.S., a lot of times uh, elected municipal officials are afraid of getting sued. <laughs> for, for passing these kinds of laws. And they're also worried about being preempted. So the, the higher level of government coming in to tell the municipality that you can't pass this kind of thing. So I, I know there's been talk about Quebec Hydro and the possibility of damming the Magpie. And this was um, a part of an effort to, to, to try to stop that. But it, did you have concerns from municipal officials about getting sued and those types of things? In fact, we have in Canada, the Supreme Court of Canada have recognized the subsidiary principle in this break tech uh, uh, decision. And as you know, that implies that in terms of protecting the environment, decision making and responsibility must rest with the lowest administrative or political level able to act effectively. So we have already that in our legal system thanks to the Supreme Court of Canada. So I think we are not going to be sued. It's the contrary. I think we're going to sue the government if they try to do something against the rights of the river. But moreover, we are trying to, um, uh, we are going to propose a new law to, um, to declare the St. Lawrence River as a legal entity. And um, yesterday and before yesterday, we had a party, a federal party who, are, who is supporting our initiative. So, uh, and we are launching a book um, where we explain what implies to grant rights and personhood to a river to start a conversation with um, government, provincial government and federal government to uh, acknowledge and recognize the St. Lawrence River. As a, um, legal person, and I think to change the paradigm and to, to begin a leader, so Canada could be a leader in that aspect as we uh, have signed the Declaration of Indigenous Peoples Rights that I think in, uh, in for United States is not as easy uh, to sign it um, an international level. But we have this advantage and, uh, and I am very grateful with that step that uh, the government of Justin Trudeau have made to sign the declaration and to engage himself to in turn that declaration in the, in, in the juridical system of Canada. So I think it, it helps a lot and we hope to inspire others and we were inspired also to take these steps today. Uh, we let you know, so the 22nd, we're going to launch our book and we are presenting a bill to be adopted by the, we hope, maybe both governments, federal and also provincial in Quebec, to grant uh, rights and personhood to the San Lorenz River. Pierre Olivier, do you want to add anything to that? Just really quickly, um, uh, the question is really good. And I think that at some point, the municipalities and the, the Band Council of Equinity really wanted to um, to 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 take action with the, the tools, the legal tools that they had. So uh, so I think I think that kind of overwhelmed the the idea of or the potential negative impacts of, of passing this, these resolutions. So it was really the idea of taking control of the protection of this river with the tools that they had. So it kind of I wouldn't I would not say ignoring the Quebec government, but uh, really taking action. Thank you guys for that. So two other uh, very quick questions. Uh, one is, 
somebody asked about others following the path that's been established with the Magpie River. I think you guys have answered that in terms of expanding to the St. Lawrence River, recognizing St. Lawrence River rights. Have you gotten other inquiries across Canada? I know we've gotten some inquiries from different folks, mostly on the West Coast, who have been following what's been happening here. Not sure if there will be any movement towards other laws being passed, at least in the Western area, but have you guys gotten inquiries from other folks? Yes, we have um, uh, many people contacting us from different provinces. So from Ontario, from uh, Nova Scotia, from British Columbia also. So they're very interested to, to follow the example. Great. I will let you know. <laughs> We're going to have many work. <laughs> And one final question in the US, one of the issues that has emerged when we talk about rights of rivers is we refer to it, I'm not sure if this will translate, but it's extra jurisdictional enforcement, which means that if the river as it flows through one municipality or one municipal boundary basically gives enforcement authority upstream for whatever happens upstream, even though upstream is not within the municipal boundary of the municipality that passed it. Are you guys kind of working on a similar parallel path? How do you how do you see that? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> who wants to answer? But we don't. I um, I think we were working upstream because uh, my Pine River is going to to be uh, is going to I don't know how to say uh, going to flow toward the San Lorenzo River. So we act upstream, so the next step would be uh, the St. Lawrence, but I don't know Pierre-Olivier would one like to add something. We, I would say that we kind of don't, we don't have this, this, this issue with the Magpie River because it's, it's completely located in the, the Mangani region that I mentioned. So we don't have this kind of jurisdictional problem, but this is, um, this is going to be interesting in the case of the St. Lawrence River, as you know, Jenny, because uh, the St. Lawrence River is, is, is located uh, in Quebec and Ontario, and so in two provinces, but also uh, the, the federal government has jurisdiction over many, many things uh, that, uh, that, yeah, that refers to the St. Lawrence River. So this is going to be very interesting to think about how this, this case is going to, um, to, to end up. So, uh, so yeah, you, you'll have more details on that uh, in a few weeks uh, with the actions that uh, Yeni and her team uh, are leading. But uh, this is an example where uh, we're going to have to consider different jurisdictions uh, for the recognition of the rights of the river. Now, what we would comment is to say that uh, that declarations um, have the power over the territory or where the municipality is, uh, has the right to take action. We cannot go over, but we can inspire the others to take the same step. Great. Thank you too for everything that you do. And uh, just for the, for folks, for attendees, we hope to have the two of you back at some point to do a full hour to spend, because I, I have a list of questions here that we weren't able to get to, but hopefully we can get to them next time. So thank you. And I'll turn it back over to Mari to, to close us out for today. Jenny and Pierre Olivier, that was incredible. Thank you. Your work is really inspiring. And they have agreed to let us share their PowerPoint presentation. So we'll make that available for everybody. Um, so you can have a handle on that. And as we put into the chat, you can find um, the Magpie Law, um, both in French and English. And um, we had it translated, so it's available at the link. Um, so we just want to thank everybody for joining us. As we've mentioned, we have future Rights of Nature 101 webinars scheduled. The next one is in September um, and then in November. But we also um, offer that and more advanced training specifically for groups or communities, wherever you might be in the world, um, that you're looking to really move something forward where you are uh, located. So we can tailor it specifically um, for the needs that you might have where you are. So we really encourage you to get in contact with us if that's something that you want to explore hosting. Um, and just lastly, just to say, we really encourage everybody to get in touch. Um, we'd love to be able to partner with you wherever you might be in the world. Um, we, and we have a host of resources on our website, um, including a recording of this webinar will be going up as well as past webinars on places like India, 
um, in Ecuador and, and other countries where really important developments are occurring around the rights of nature. So please don't hesitate to check those out. Um, and we look forward to being in touch with everyone to let you know about upcoming events and when we can spend some more time with Jenny and Pierre Olivier as well, because we'd really love to have them return and we can go even deeper than we we're able to go today. So thank you so much for your presentations and thank you everybody for joining us. We hope you have a fantastic evening um, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. Have a nice evening. Thank you, everyone.